that trip down to El Salvador was nothing short of amazing. We had a wonderful time in teaching lessons, leading songs, constructing crafts, providing food bags, uh, sharing or supplying uh, readers, reader glasses that is, and uttering prayers together. It reminds me of the text we're going to look at tonight concerning Paul's single-minded focus. His single-minded focus was to live for Christ and the gospel And indeed, that is the case when we go to El Salvador. We get to reunite with brothers and sisters who who have their minds set solely on living for Christ and living for the gospel. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, Paul was looking beyond his circumstances as a prisoner at the time in, in Rome to what it meant for Christ. Christ is mentioned some 18 times in Philippians chapter 1. And furthermore, what it meant for the gospel. The gospel is mentioned six times in this one chapter. Paul's circumstances at the time of being in prison were used though as a catalyst for him to show that his circumstances would strengthen the fellowship of the gospel. Philippians chapter 1 verses 1 through 11. That it would promote the furtherance of the gospel. Philippians chapter 1 verses 12 through 16. And that it would guard the faith of the gospel. Philippians 1 verses 27 through 30. So I invite you tonight to take a closer look with me at the first of these thoughts. That Paul's circumstances strengthened the fellowship of the gospel. Philippians chapter 1 verses 1 through 11. Specifically looking at verses 3 through 11. The word fellowship at its most basic level means to have in common. This explanation often hinders our understanding of Christian fellowship because we apply it in places where it should not be applied. We think that any time we get together there's fellowship, that fellowship happens. That's not the case. You see, too often what we think is fellowship is nothing more than acquaintanceship. Or friendship. Friends just hanging out together. Doesn't create fellowship. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 1, Paul writes about the fellowship of the Spirit enjoyed only by those who have been born of the Spirit. Romans 8 and verse 9. There is fellowship in the sufferings of Christ. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. And then when we share what we have with others, there is also fellowship. Philippians chapter 4 verse 15. You may have to study the word shared there in that verse. Its root word is the same word used for fellowship. Having fellowship with one another. You see, true Christian fellowship is much more than having a name on a church roll or a picture in the directory or even being present at assembly times. It's possible to be very close to people physically while miles away from one another spiritually. Christian fellowship is being spiritually close to one another because of our nearness to Christ. The closer we are to Christ, the more there is fellowship within us. Paul was in Rome. His friends were miles away in Philippi. But their spiritual fellowship was so real and so satisfying that it brought Paul great joy when he thought of them. Christian fellowship, as described by Paul in this chapter, is threefold. There is the fellowship of the mind, fellowship of the heart, and fellowship in prayer. Notice Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. As Paul wrote about fellowship of the mind, he said, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy, in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the last day until now. For I am convinced or confident of this very thing, 
that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you because I have you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in the defense of the confirmation of the gospel. You're all partakers of the grace with me. For God is my witness how I longed for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. And as I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Paul was mindful of his friends in Philippi. As he awaits his trial in Rome, his mind goes back to the brethren, the believers in Philippi, and every recollection he has brings him joy. But in Acts chapter 16, the Bible tells us while Paul was in Philippi, that he was wrongfully arrested and beaten. He was placed in the stocks and he was humiliated before the people. Yet these memories brought joy to Paul because it was through his suffering that the jailer came to Christ. Paul also recalled Lydia and her household who responded to Paul's teaching and were baptized. He remembered the poor slave girl who had been demon-possessed and was healed in the name of Jesus Christ, Acts chapter 16, verse 18. It was the Christians at Philippi that brought Paul joy. Not his present circumstances of being in jail, not his past circumstances of the experiences of Philippi of being mistreated, but rather the people. Their salvation was more important to him than any mistreatment he could face. So in reflecting upon the time with them, the thoughts that filled his mind were those of the people and their trust in God's Son along with their obedience to Christ's teachings. Fellowship. If we have this single mind to live for Christ and the gospel, then we will realize people, not circumstances, people, not programs, bring about Christian fellowship. Programs only aid us in having an opportunity for Christian fellowship. But it's people that make and bring about Christian fellowship. And when Paul thought about those brethren in Philippi, and he thought about them in his time of imprisonment, it brought him great joy. It begs the question of, am I the kind of Christian who brings joy to others when they think about me? To get through dark times in our lives... We need to be mindful of and call to remembrance the faith of other Christians and what our suffering may mean for them and how we handle our difficult circumstances, how we handle our difficulties of life will bear and reflect upon them what it means to be a Christian and to suffer as a Christian. Fellowship of the mind is experienced when we focus on living for Christ and living for the gospel. When we visit El Salvador, it's very clear and evident that there is one purpose, to live for Christ and live for the gospel. But Paul says it's not enough just to have people in your mind and to have fellowship of the mind. You need to have fellowship of the heart, verses 7 and 8. Read it once more. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because because I have you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. It is possible to have others on our minds without having them on our hearts. If we were to be honest, many people today would have to confess, I have you on my nerves 
more than I have you on my mind or on my heart. You get on my nerves. But Paul's sincere love for his friends was something that could not be disguised. It was something that could not be hidden. His love for them exuded from him in his prayer life, even into his writings. You see, Christian love is truly the tie that binds. Love is evidence of one's salvation. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 14 proclaims, We know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. There is at least seven instances in this short letter where Paul uses the phrase, you all. You all, including everyone, excluding no one. Paul's love was for every soul. Thus he continued and considered his difficult circumstances an opportunity for defending and confirming the gospel before the officials of Rome, knowing that this would help his brethren everywhere in the Roman world. But then, by extension of influence to all Christians, Paul longed for his friends with the affection of Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 1, verse 8. It was not Paul's love channeled through Christ to them. Rather, it was Christ's love channeled through Paul to them. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5 reveals that the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has or was given to us. God has given us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one who has poured out God's love within us so that when we go out and share love with others, we are the channel through which they experience God's love. How can we tell then if we are truly in a bond of love with other Christians? Well, one way is to recognize that being in the bond of love with other Christians means we are, con- are concerned about them. The believers at Philippi were concerned about Paul, and so they sent Epaphroditus to minister to him. But Paul was also greatly concerned about his friends at Philippi, especially when Epaphroditus became ill and could not return to them right away. Philippians chapter 2, verses 25 through 28. Another evidence of Christian love is a willingness to forgive one another. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 5 states, Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. Other translations say that love does not keep a record of wrongs. Christians who practice love always experience joy because both of them come as a result of the same Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, comma, joy. Galatians 5 verse 22. To experience love is to experience joy and to have it from the same Holy Spirit. And it takes place in fellowship. The fellowship of the heart is experienced through growing in love for one another can't go to El Salvador without singing I love you with the love of the Lord. Their love for one another is very strong. Their love for the church in Waverly is very strong. Then there is the fellowship of prayer that Paul mentions in verses 9 through 11. He says and writes, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. The joy that Paul had was the joy which he felt when he remembered his brothers and sisters before the throne of God above. Perhaps the deepest 
Christian fellowship and the deepest joy we can experience in this life is praying with and for one another. Paul prayed for maturity in the Christians. The maturity he sought began with abounding love and a discerning love. You see, the love in the mind should become the love in the heart and vice versa. And abounding all the more. Reciprocating one another. Then the heart and the mind work together so that growth and discernment takes place. That maturity then continued with Christian character, sincere and blameless, Paul said. The kind of character that can pass the test. The kind of character that proves one to be unmixed, to be genuine, to be unadulterated. One that has love that is pure and motives that are pure. The character that it takes to not stumble nor to cause others to stumble. The maturity included Christian service, being filled with the fruit of righteousness. The spiritual maturity of service requires the kind of spiritual fruit that is produced when we are in fellowship with Christ. He is the vine. We are the branches. But if we bear no fruit, we're to be cut off and cast away. But if we abide in the vine... We are healthy branches, then we bear much fruit. Being filled with the fruit of righteousness results in the fruit of the Spirit being presented to all who come around us. Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23. It results in the lost souls being obtained for Christ. Romans 1 and verse 13. And sanctification or holiness shines as a benefit of being with Christ. Romans 6 and verse 22. Fellowship of prayer is enjoyed when we feel the pulse of fellow workers praying for spiritual growth. I could share a name and immediately Isaiah would chuckle. It was one night at camp that a young man said, Mr. K, would you pray for me? Absolutely. He said, Mr. K, you don't even know what I want you to pray for. He said, I know, Grady, but I don't think you're going to ask me to pray for anything that God wouldn't already ask me to pray for concerning you. I made my way over to his bed, sat down at the foot of his bed, and I asked, Grady, what do you want me to pray for? Nine years old. Mr. K, would you pray for me to grow spiritually? The kids get it when we so often do not get it. When we've forgotten things that we learned at a very young age, The brethren in El Salvador are excitedly thinking about next year's mission trip. In fact, they're already planning the work to be done in 2024. Two years from now. How can you think about working with someone without having them in mind? How can you plan for the future without being mindful of others? The future needs to be talked about. And plans for the future should include dreams and expectations. Just as Paul's prayer for the Christians at Philippi. The love the Salvadorian Christians have for us here is very evident. Alexander Levia asked multiple times, Will you please make sure the brethren at home know that we are thankful? Will you thank them for us? Thank them for letting you come. Thank them for preparing all that has been done this week. 
Will you tell them how much we love them? Words cannot describe it. Jorge Torres Jr. and Alex Torres checked on me several times throughout our days in El Salvador. And almost every time that they checked on me, they asked about my family and then they asked about the church in Waverly. And if they didn't ask about the church in Waverly as the entire body, they were asking about specific individuals. How's Brother Larry? How's Brother David? How's Sister Rowena? They are constantly mindful of us. Have we forgotten that from such a very small young age we learned at one time that the more we get together, the happier we'll be? Have we forgotten that? The more we get together, the happier we'll be. In part because the more we are around one another, the more we will love one another. The more we will find that one another fulfills our needs. Prayers for the church and for her successful growth are spoken often in El Salvador. I can hardly be... a part of a conversation with Jorge or Jorge Jr. or with Alex without them mentioning the church. I can rarely be a part of a conversation with them without one of them asking, when do you preach next, brother? I need to pray for you. The church in El Salvador is praying. It's praying for the church in Waverly praying for her growth, for her strength, for her means to continue helping the church there. But our prayers also continue. I pray that their plans for next year are successful, that they come to pass, that they meet their goals. And I pray that their plans and goals for 2024 are successful as well. I also hope that we have an opportunity to give at some point a mission report and share with you what they shared with us. To the untrained eye, in fellowship with El Salvador, speaks of remembering one another, being concerned for one another, praying for one another because we go once a year to El Salvador. True Christian fellowship, as Paul has spoke of it in Philippians chapter 1, takes place even if we are thousands of miles away from one another, when we are in fellowship with the Savior. You see, El Salvador means the Savior. Are you in fellowship? with the Savior, sharing in the activities or privileges of an intimate association with Christ? Do you think about Him often and plan ways to learn more about Him? Are you concerned about His life being lived out in your life, Galatians 2 verse 20, and about His work being accomplished through you? Do you pray for the success of the church, especially spiritual maturity and salvation? God has called us into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. John would write what we, speaking of the apostles, have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. 1 John 1 verse 3. We enjoy a fellowship that must be proclaimed to others. A intimate and very close association with Jesus that needs to be shared with others so that they too can come and enjoy this fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and His Son. 
John then added in verses 6 and 7 of 1 John 1, If we say we have fellowship with Him, and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. Being in fellowship with the Father and the Son means we have heard the call of God through His Word. We have answered the call to come out of darkness and to come to Christ by having our sins washed away in the blood of Jesus, Revelation 7 verse 14, and that we now walk in the light as He Himself is in the light so that His blood keeps on cleansing us from all sin. Our fellowship is based upon how close we are to Christ. The closer we are to Christ, the more He will be on our mind. The closer we are to Christ, the more He will be on our heart. The closer we are to Christ, the more He will be in our prayers. Are you in fellowship with the Savior? If you're not, tonight's the night. Now's the time to come and enter into that fellowship. If you are a Christian, but you've allowed things to come between you and your Savior, and you've wandered away, you've allowed things to hinder the spiritual growth that should take place, Tonight's the night to change it. Because ultimately, your fellowship with the Savior will determine your eternal destiny. Are you in fellowship with the Savior? If you're not, come now as we stand and sing.